Okay, Jayla. <laughs> okay, it's 12.15 now. Can everybody hear me? Can I have, yes, thank you very much. Thumbs up. <laughs> okay, we are start, starting now. Um, I, I need to let you know that we are recording uh, this Zoom meeting. Uh, Professor Wills gave us authorization and you will be able to check uh, the recording then in YouTube after we're done. Uh, welcome to the sounding board. My name is Nellie High Iredale. I'm the sounding board chair. This is Oceanic 68th year, which is an official support group of the university. The sounding board is a joint effort of the faculty club and Oceanics. Our honorary chair is Justine Kavulakis, the associate of the chancellor, and our president, Nigella Hilgert. In Oceanics, we raise money for grants and awards for students, support other UCSD events and activities such as the student-run free clinic. We offer many events for our members and Sounding Board is one of these events. We would love to have you as a member and I encourage you to join. It's only $35 per year. We are happy to see you now via Zoom. And we have this event every first Thursday of the month throughout the academic year, except for January. And we will have an additional presentation in the month of June. And now um, I would like to introduce to you uh, to our speaker, Professor Chris Wills, PhD. He's the Emeritus Professor of Bio Biological Sciences from UCSD. A little about his bio. His very interesting bio. Dr. Wills received his BA and Master's of Science in Biology from the University of British Columbia and PhD in Genetics from UC Berkeley. He was an NIH postdoctoral fellow at Berkeley and assistant professor of biology at Wesleyan University in Connecticut and associate and full professor of biology at UCSD from 1972 until his retirement in 2010. His research interests include the evolution of enzymes in the laboratory, the maintenance of genetic variability in human populations, the forces that maintain variation in complex ecosystems, such as rainforests and coral reefs, the evolution of diseases and the evolution of our species. He held a Guggenheim Fellowship and received an award for public understanding of science and technology from the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 1999. He has written several books between them, The Runaway Brain, Children of Prometheus, and The Accelerating Pace of Human Evolution, which was finalist for the 2000 Adventist Prize, the most important English prize for science books. A recent book, The Darwinian Tourist, Viewing the World Through Evolutionary Eyes, was called probably the year's most important travel book by Condé Nast Traveler. We also have Judy Vaquier hosting. Thank you very much, Judy. And um, we will have questions at the end. If you would like to digitally um, raise your hand or put it in the chat room. And um, the subject of Dr. Bill's presentation will be Darwinian Tourism Revisited. And Dr. Wills is now sharing his screen. We will start with the presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Wills, for being here. We really appreciate it. Please go ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Nelly, for that very nice introduction. Let me just rearrange this screen a little bit here. And what I'm going to do is, wait a minute, I may have, I have to hide all these controls and things. Okay, I hope that everyone can see this clearly enough. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is a kind of an extension of a book that I wrote um, over a decade ago now called The Darwinian Tourist. And, uh, the reason I wrote the book was because I'd been writing books about evolution for a long time, but it occurred to me that one nice thing, and I, in the process, uh, in addition to, to my own research, uh, I was also traveling around the world for a wide variety of reasons. And I thought, uh, why not try to 
present the world, present all the things that people go to see and other things that many, many people may not have seen in an evolutionary context, because the world, of course, has a long billions of years history. And if we go to a, a place and, let's say, uh, simply lie on a beach or, or drink a few martyrs and things like that, we're, we're really missing an enormous amount about what has happened to that part of the world. And uh, to try to put this into an evolutionary context was the goal of the book. More recently, uh, I've discovered that many of the topics in the book have undergone dramatic changes in the near decades since I wrote it. So you always think somehow of evolution as being a slow process, but in fact, the study of evolution has been uh, uh, continuing with blinding speed at the present time. We have technologies now looking at ancient DNA and many other things that we can do that were totally unimaginable to, to evolutionary biologists of my generation. And we're finding out so many wonderful things. What I'm going to try to do today is very briefly catch you up on some of the things that I talked about in the book and show some of the things that have happened since then. But I have to try to put those into context. So, the trick here, it appears. So here we go. All right. So we're gonna be talking about some adventures from the book and some new adventures. First of all, we'll have a look at the restless earth. What sorts of processes have we, what sorts of processes have shaped the world that we see at the present time? I also would like to talk about some of the uh, peoples of remote parts of the world that my, Liz, my wife Liz and I have visited um, and to give you some context, recent context on where they came from, how they evolved, how they interacted with, and in some cases, exchanged genes with our own species. And this is a rapidly evolving area, one that's really, you've been seeing headlines about it. I'll try to put this into, into some context. And then we'll do a little bit of a new adventure. In the book, I talked a little bit about the things that are primarily occupying my own research program at the moment, which are the evolution of complex ecosystems, rainforests, uh, forests in general, um, uh, coral reefs and other marine uh, environments. All these things essentially can be looked at once again from an evolutionary perspective. And a lot has been happening there as well. What I cannot do, however, is make this thing advance. Ah, wait a minute. Here we go, good. But let's start with the restless earth. Here we have a quick picture of the great ring of fire, which essentially runs all the way around the Pacific Basin. We happen to live in a relatively quiescent part of the ring of fire. There's some pretty dramatic things happen, have happened in, in California. Uh, many, many more dramatic and more recent things have happened in other parts of the ring. We'll be spending a good deal of time in this part of the world, a good deal of time up here around uh, the Philippine Trench, and a certain amount of time here in South America as well. So we'll have a look at the ring and at some of the things that have gone on. We'll start uh, with some islands in the middle of the Pacific that I visited some years ago for several reasons, one of which was the wonderful diving that could be done in these places. And one of these islands in particular, uh, part of the, the, uh, uh, the Palau, Guam, uh, uh, Micronesians and the, and the Marshall Islands, one of the islands is a remarkable island called Yap, which is right here in the middle of the Pacific uh, with an awful lot of ocean around it. The people of Yap have preserved their own uh, dramatic and beautiful Polynesian culture to a great degree. It's an absolutely gorgeous island. The people are really, really do spend a lot of time uh, uh, living uh, their, their culture and trying to present the culture to visitors and a, and a very happy group of people they are. There are also interesting creatures around the islands uh, on the reefs that uh, lie offshore. In particular, these mandarin fish, for example, are uh, uh, mating. They come out in the evening and uh, mate in, on many evenings. You have to sit there for quite a long time on the reef and wait until they pose. And a couple of these fish did that for me. 
One of the nice things about the uh, lagoon that surrounds the island is that um, it is an abode of a large number of uh, the reef manta rays. There are reef mantas and oceanic mantas, uh, and the reef mantas come into the reef to get clean. They go to special cleaning stations on the reef. You, many of you have done some snorkeling will have seen cleaning stations on coral reefs where the big fish come in and are cleaned by the little ones. The same thing happens with the manta rays. They swim in, get very close to the reef itself, and little fish swim in and out of their gills and clean any parasites that might have accumulated there. We were watching some of these mantas on the reef at about 60 feet down, and all of a sudden, a tremendous number of blows hit us as if we were being hit by, it's as if we were being hit by a jackhammer. And we looked at each other in astonishment, what on earth is going on? I thought perhaps it was a, a giant boat going overhead or something like that. And we looked about and uh, none of our tanks had blown up or anything like that. So that wasn't the problem. And then I looked further up beyond everybody and realized that there was this uh, underwater landslide coming down towards us. This is the only picture I got of the landslide. You can see all this stuff coming down the reef. And uh, so uh, we got up above the landslide area and gradually worked our way back up to the surface, doing our safety stops, I, uh, I might point out, and reached the surface and realized that what had happened was that it was an underwater earthquake. It turned out that the earthquake's epicenter was only about 10 kilometers away. And the strength of the earthquake was 5.4. This was back in 2008. And even though people on land had hardly felt the earthquake at all, uh, underwater, the earthquake was extremely strong. It turned out, in fact, to be so strong that even though I'd left the island at this point, some of the other divers went around and sent me some pictures that they'd seen of damage on the reef. Here's a big coral head, for example, which has broken off the reef and rolled down the slope. You can see that this head was at one point all sort of rooted down here, it's all broken away. And so quite obviously these reefs uh, were, could be very severely damaged by an earthquake that really had very little effect on land. So earthquakes are sudden, they're unpredictable, their effects can be magnified or, or minimized depending on where you are. Um, it's just an indication of how unstable this whole ring of fire region is. Charles Darwin encountered such an earthquake only far, far more severe when he was voyaging around the world on the Beagle. The Beagle spent a great deal of time in South America, sailing among other things up the west coast of South America along the coast of Chile. And Darwin went ashore at one point and suddenly he was in a forest, suddenly he was knocked off his feet by a very severe earthquake. This earthquake was eight point something on the Richter scale and near as we can estimate it. And uh, it was accompanied by a number of tidal waves. The earthquake caused a lot of damage to the area around where the Beagle was. In particular, the little town of Concepcion, which at that time was relatively small, but which has now grown up to be the second biggest city in Chile. Uh, the town was pretty much devastated. This is the ruins of the Cathedral of Concepcion, um, which was hit by this earthquake in 1835, just when the Beagle was there. And they figure it was an eight-point earthquake. Uh, of course, you have to put some, some errors on that number. We can't be sure of it exactly. Um, so Darwin is very impressed by this. And in particular, he was astonished by the fact that the entire coastline had been lifted up. And you could tell this because as he sailed along the coastline afterwards, they could see that many of the intertidal organisms had been lifted up above the high tide level. The whole coastal area had been lifted up several feet by this earthquake. And he realized that earthquake after earthquake of this magnitude could over time have caused enormous changes in the area. And we now know that because of the collision of continental plates along the west coast of South America, continental plate the, and the Pacific Oceanic plate, uh, this collision has lifted up the Andes Mountains. The Andes, which are relatively young mountains, have been created essentially by a whole series of such events. Well, this goes on because at Concepcion, almost exactly 175 years after Darwin's visit, another earthquake, roughly 8.8, .8, hit uh, Concepcion, caused a great deal of damage, as you can see. Uh, and luckily not too many people were injured or died in this earthquake, but you can see that earthquakes are uh, 
uh, an enormous shaper of the world. So when you look at a range of mountains and they seem to be quite immovable, they seem as if they've been there forever. Darwin realized, and many other people have done, that mountains are ephemeral. Mountains come, mountains go, and this is all just part of the whole history of the planet. So what we're going to be doing then is, as we chase around the world, we'll be looking at some of these extremely tectonically active regions of the world. Here's a region we'll be spending quite a bit of time on, um, where several different plates come together. The Eurasian plate, the Philippine plate, the Pacific and the Australian plates have all come together in the region of Indonesia. And these plates are continuing, of course, to be extremely active. Lots and lots of earthquakes, lots of volcanic eruptions in this area. This, of course, is the location of the really big, uh, 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 big earthquake, the big uh, subsea subsidence that caused the enormous tsunami of 2001. So let's have a look at what happens when our ancestors migrated into a uh, part of the world. I have to introduce some of them here. Some of them actually didn't migrate here, but migrated uh, to other places. And nonetheless, their genes are continuing to play a part in this story. Um, here we have uh, Homo neanderthalensis. The Neanderthals we've all heard of, these were inhabitants of, uh, of Europe and Central Asia. Um, who lived uh, in this whole region, thrived in this whole region for a better part of a million years, and were eventually displaced by the recent arrival, the very recent arrival of modern humans, starting in uh, in uh, the Middle East, working there in Africa, then through the Middle East, and then working their way up into Europe and also uh, into Central Asia. So the Neanderthals are gone but some of their genes have been left behind because pretty much all of us in this audience, I think, carry something on the order of one or 2% the antifold genes as a result of exchanges between modern human, uh, modern human ancestors and the Neanderthals, primarily in the Middle East, but also it appears in other regions as well. Over here, we have Homo erectus. Now Homo erectus, uh, starting in Africa, spread out through Europe, uh, a little bit of Europe, uh, through uh, 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 probably up into uh, 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 the, the Middle East. Uh, uh, we're not sure exactly how far west it got, probably not very far, but it certainly got into Central Asia and all the way into Eastern Asia, and all the way down into the collection of islands that makes up that huge archipelago of islands in Southeast Asia. Homo erectus was the first of our ancestors to leave Africa. Here we have modern humans. Modern humans, we can date with reasonable certainty now to about 300,000 years, where people very much like us have been around for 300,000 years. Um, in Morocco, just recently, some 300,000 year old uh, uh, remains were dated for the first time accurately. Uh, discovered that they were in fact uh, that old, and they were remarkably similar to, but not quite the same as modern humans. Here are some skulls of some people uh, of uh, close to 200,000 years old who lived in Ethiopia. And then we have perhaps the most mysterious of our ancestors of them all. These are the, 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 the Denethemans. Now the Denethemans are named after uh, the cave in the Ural Mountains, sorry, the, in, the, in the Altai Mountains of Central Asia. And this cave has little bones in it, and over they have, it, turns, it turns out the Anatol remains in it, and also some uh, remains that didn't seem to match humans or modern humans or Neanderthals, but it turned out that these bones belong to a group of people who branched off from our ancestors and the Neanderthals uh, something on the order of six or seven hundred thousand years ago. And all we know about these people is this one jawbone that was found in Tibet very recently and a few other bone fragments, but we have all their genes. We have a very, very complete set of genes for the Denethemans. So we may not know much about them. We don't know what they look like. We have no idea what they did, but we do know what their genes are. And that allows us to really get an idea of the role that the Denisovans, the mysterious Denisovans, played in our ancestry. So this shows you the end of the migration path of Homo erectus. 
which started in Africa almost two million years ago, and where somewhere on the order of one and a half million years ago, they had made it all the way uh, across Asia, all the way down through peninsular Malaysia to these islands, which now uh, make up uh, uh, Indonesia. And many of these islands were at the time of this migration joined together because sea level was much lower in those days. And this huge area is called Sundaland. Um, and as you can see, uh, Sumatra, uh, the Malaysian Peninsula, Borneo, and so on, were all joined together by this huge amount of land, much of which is currently underwater. They were therefore pretty, it was pretty easy for them to migrate down through here. And they got all the way out through the Lesser Sunda Islands, partway across the Lesser Sunda, we don't know exactly how far they got. This all happened, as I say, on the order of a million years ago, and they finally got to this point. And we don't know very much about these people. We do know they had primitive stone tools. We don't know much more about their technology or their culture. We can trace out the migrations of the Neanderthals and the mysterious migrations of the Denisovans uh, in this picture. You can see that the Neanderthals primarily migrated uh, uh, probably the ancestors of the Neanderthals, uh, perhaps Homo heidelbergensis, uh, migrated in the European direction. They split off here in the Middle East. Uh, another group of Neanderthals headed up here towards Central Asia. This is the niece of a cave where Denisovans were found and Neanderthals were found, and where quite recently a Denisovan Neanderthal hybrid person was found, a person whose DNA is essentially a half Denisovan and half Neanderthal. An astonishing discovery. The Denisovans, we do know, migrated around much of uh, Southern Asia. This is long before modern humans got here. The Denisovans were wandering around this whole area, and later on, they would uh, hybridize with modern humans who were coming very much later through this same migration route. The Denisovans made it somewhere down here, and we don't know exactly how far. But some recent genetic evidence suggests that they may have made it all the way out, astonishingly enough, to New Guinea and to the island of New Britain beyond New Guinea. An astonishing uh, situation here. Okay. The spread of modern humans out of Africa uh, began something on the order of 120,000 years ago, and modern humans spread out into Europe, obviously, uh, down through uh, Southern Asia down through Peninsular Asia, all the way eventually to uh, New Guinea and to Australia, and also up here into uh, Eastern Asia. And then eventually, many thousands of years later, managed to make it across the Bering Strait and down here into North and South America. We really got around. But of course, we had perhaps better technology than the primitive peoples who had, who had preceded us. If we look at Indonesia now, we can see some of the traces, not only of these migrations, but also of the, uh, the events, the geological processes that uh, shaped these islands. In particular, as we look at the Indonesian islands, we see that they can be separated by a line. This is a line that was drawn by Alfred Russell Wallace, who was the co-discoverer of the idea of natural selection. Wallace's line, uh, is a line that essentially divides this whole region into two halves. On this side, the birds the, and the animals and the plants are primarily of uh, Asian origin. On this side of the line, many, many of the birds and animals and plants are from the Australasian region, the Australia, uh, New Guinea, and uh, uh, indeed some all the way back to South America. Essentially, they, what we're looking at here are the descendants of organisms that that rode this whole breakup of the great southern continent of Gondwana um, uh, on the order of 100 million years ago. As these continents broke up, these groups of organisms, including many marsupial mammals, eventually populated this whole region. And Wallace said, pointed out there was a big divide here between these. And the reason there is such a divide is because these tectonic plates that we talked about earlier have been moving around and colliding. The line doesn't exactly coincide with the current plates, 
but it's approximately the case. What we're seeing here is the result of these islands over here, or their ancestral bits of land, uh, were at one point clearly separated from these islands here. And as a consequence, by being brought together by the movement of the plates, uh, Wallace's line essentially formed. So we can search then for the first humans who made it into this complex. And let me look at both at the group of uh, groups of humans who made it into uh, Indonesia, and then we'll have a look at another remarkable group of people who were left behind in Africa, the sun. Anything has decided to. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. So here we have the Banda Islands and this, uh, uh, the Lesser Sundas, and this series of islands, which include um, uh, a lot of islands that some of you at least may have visited, uh, particularly that some of you may have gone to Komodo Island to see the famous Komodo dragons. Uh, Rinka and Komodo are the only two islands where these dragons still live. The dragons come from this side of Wallace's line, and they uh, are the, currently the largest lizards that we, can, that we have on the planet. Uh, the old races of Komodo dragons used to be much larger than the present day ones, and the present day ones, goodness knows, are big enough. Then we have the island of Flores, which is the island of the mysterious hobbits. Now, we haven't talked about the hobbits yet, but let me talk about them a little bit. The hobbits uh, present one of the great puzzles of uh, the history of our ancestors. The hobbits uh, worked their way uh, all the way down through the same route that Homo erectus took. We know that Homo erectus got almost as far as Flores and may have gotten as far as Flores because tools that resemble the tools of Homo erectus have been found on the island of Flores. So, and they are almost a million years old. So they got there a long time ago. Were the hobbits uh, descendants of Homo erectus? Were they a different group that came with Homo erectus? We have no idea, but they are dramatically different from us and from Homo erectus, as we'll see. Now, the hobbits were. Uh, the reason they called hobbits, of course, is because uh, reporters who got hold of the story uh, named the hobbits after uh, named them after the the hobbits of of, uh, of the Lord of the Rings, um, little people with large feet, large hairy feet. Now, in fact, the hobbits, it turns out, the actual hobbits had pretty big feet relative to their body size. They they were only about three feet tall, but their feet were quite big uh, in proportion. And whether their feet were hairy or not, we have no idea. Nonetheless, it was just uh, too good a story for the uh, reporters to pass up. And so the hobbits they have become. So what kind of a world did the hobbits face? The hobbits faced a world in, that was with, with full of baby and uh, little pygmy animals. These are animals, uh, stegodons, real stegodons, the original stegodons were much bigger, they're relatives of the elephants. The real stegodons were big, but these were reduced size stegodons that were populating these islands. Uh, uh, mammals on islands tend to shrink because of selective value and being small in an island where there isn't that much food. And they had a very interesting set of trunks, you can see here, uh, sorry, of uh, 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 tusks. The tusks are grown very closely together and you can they, they probably had to drape their trunks one side of the tusks or the other, so they really were quite different from modern elephants. Then you had the Komodo dragons. There we go. Here we are on our way to Rinka Island, which is one of the two islands there where these animals still exist. Another view of Rinka, it's a beautiful place. And here is a dragon. If you get off the island, you'll find yourself surrounded by these dragons. It's a bit unnerving because they have a poisonous bite. You have to be rather careful about them. Near the island of Rinka, very close. In fact, I sailed over to Rinka from this island, the island of Flores. Flores is a much bigger island, beautiful island. 
Uh, and on the island of Flores, there used to be Komodo dragons until very recently, in fact. Um, and also, there were hobbits. This is the cave, the Angwa cave, where the uh, remains of the hobbits were found by a group of Indonesia and, and, and Australian paleontologists who did excavations in the floor of this cavern. It's very hard to do these excavations. The cavern is very damp. It's very hard to, to, to dig things out. You look down here in this, uh, in this um, uh, excavation, you can see it's pretty scary down there. You have to have lots and lots of support to stop the mud from coming in and burying you. This is the late Michael Warwood, who was my host for my little visit, and other members of the, uh, the Hobbit team. And uh, they are looking at uh, the, the tools that were left behind, small, simple stone tools that were used by them, uh, the bones of the Thagadons and of the, uh, and, and of the uh, uh, Komodo dragons that were also found in the cave. So they were apparently able to hunt these big animals. Um, and the hobbits, though, were, as we can see here, very small indeed. Here we have a modern human skull. Here we have Homo floresiensis, which is the formal name of the hobbits. Uh, you can see that Homo floresiensis is much smaller. Um, and indeed, these people were only about three feet tall. And their brain size was about the same size as the brain of a chimpanzee. Nonetheless, they were uh, tool users. Presumably, they were able to communicate with each other because they were able to hunt big animals. Um, all kinds of things we don't know about the hobbits. What we really need from the hobbits is some DNA, and we don't have it because they've been buried in tropical areas where the DNA has all essentially disappeared. Sooner or later, I'm confident somebody will figure out how to get DNA uh, from either the hobbits or from the caves in which they live. And that, I think, is going to be a big story when it happens because then we'll know uh, just where they fit on the great family tree of humans. So, it looks as if some of the people who were able to make it all the way out as far as these folks did were pretty clever. This, by the way, is an excavation near the cave where some of the bones that were originally attributed to Homo erectus, uh, sorry, some of the stone tools that were originally attributed to Homo erectus have been found. Modern humans arrived in the Sunda Islands very much later, about 70,000 years ago, perhaps. And we now have found quite recently, absolutely astonishing cave art. Now, at the time I visited some of these islands, I had no idea that this cave art was sitting there ready to be found in Borneo, Sulawesi, uh, art, which is the equal of anything that's been found in France or Spain, and it's if anything considerably older than the oldest cave paintings in France or Spain. These people, these modern humans, had all kinds of talents that we somehow assumed were the property of Europeans. But it looks like it wasn't the property of human beings. Lots of people who left Africa and migrated over the whole world were carrying with them remarkable capabilities. This is uh, the island of Sulawesi. Um, and uh, it's... I could do an entire talk about Sulawesi, and in fact, I have done. Uh, it's a, a truly astonishing island with lots and lots of deep diving, lots and lots of fascinating animals. We'll have a look very quickly at some of them. Um, we spent some time down here in southern Sulawesi and up here towards the astonishing region of Tana to Raja. Uh, and on the way, we passed through an area that I didn't know at the time was an area where these cave paintings had been found. Some of these very old cave paintings have been found. As we passed through it, I had no idea. I took some pictures of the area, but no, no notion. Sulawesi is one of the few places where um, coelacanths have been found, living fossils. They have fabulous coral reefs here with beautiful soft corals. All kinds of creatures. There's a paddle flap scorpion fish that I photographed on Sulawesi. Other creatures like the mantis shrimp. And on land, you will find animals that live on one side of the Wallace's line intermingled with animals on the other side, because in Sulawesi, the Wallace's line is blurred. You have a marsupial couscous, which is uh, a relative of the opossums. Uh, there are lots of couscouses in this region, in New Guinea, and all the way down to Northern Australia. These are animals with pouches. Uh, they are like kangaroos. 
and not far away, a spectral tarsier. Tarsiers are, are, are uh, primates, uh, very small insectivorous primates, but really quite close relatives of ourselves. And black crested macaques, as you can see here. This is uh, the boss of the macaque troop. And this is a famous picture, it's worldwide. Uh, I borrowed it from the internet. It's a picture that a macaque took of a using a camera that he stole from a tourist. And this selfie of the macaque immediately uh, hit the, uh, the headlines all the way around the world. It turns out to be very, uh, a very useful thing for it to have done because it got so much publicity that quite a lot of money has now come into this whole area to make sure that the macaques in, that, in this region are, are preserved and, and protected. These are the mountains of southern Sulawesi where the cave art was found. And as I say, I took this picture having no idea what this remarkable stuff was that was up there somewhere. Here is a picture of a dwarf bovid, an area on the right here. Um, this picture is at least 43,000 years old. We know that because it's possible to, to date the, the, the layer of deposit which is accumulated on the top of the picture itself. Um, and there are all these little, little pictures of people. Well, there's sort of a people who are kind of hybridized with animals because they have human characters and animal characteristics. And they're obviously all hunting this bovid. Uh, so it's really uh, quite a dramatic picture, 43,000 years old, older than anything in Asia, in Europe, anything in, uh, in France or in Spain. Here's another one uh, discovered nearby. This is a pig. Notice how the pig has been shaded by this artist who lived over 45,000 years ago. So that's Sulawesi. This gives us a notion of the kinds of people who were arriving there. Uh, and then when some of them went on and migrated further, they migrated past Flores, they migrated all the way down to New Guinea and eventually from New Guinea down into Australia. Um, this is the Western half of New Guinea, the Indonesian half of, West, of, of uh, New Guinea. And uh, some while ago, we visited the Baliam Valley here in the central of the uh, center part of the island. This is a region that was only opened up to the West uh, after World War II. And people who lived there who had in independently invented agriculture were uh, exposed to Western uh, influences for the first time. These people, uh, are remarkable. There are many, many, many tribes that live in this area. These are Danny tribes people. We're putting on a little war for our benefit. We, we brought them a pig and in the, as, as a thanks, they put on a bit of a war. You can see the, uh, the uh, uh, warriors here are extremely fierce. They've got these uh, pig tusks that they wear through their noses. This is the chief of the local uh, village, uh, Chief uh, Willem. Uh, who is really one of the most uh, impressive human beings I think I've ever met. Here's my wife visiting some of the ladies of the village, and you can see that they, the ladies are still in the thrall of some very, very ancient customs, distressing customs to our eyes, I think. Um, the elder ladies in the village, you can see here, their fingers have all been shortened. And the reason they have lost the first joint of their fingers is because whenever a man in the village dies, a girl is picked and is required to sacrifice the first joint of one of her fingers. And over time, all these ladies have lost those joints. The younger girls are no longer taking part in this uh, tradition. They've decided maybe it's not such a good idea. And uh, I think it's a tradition that even though it's undoubtedly thousands and thousands of years old, I think it's something that could uh, very sensibly be gotten rid of. You can find remarkable groups of people throughout this whole region. Off to the eastern end of New Guinea is another large island called New Britain. And the people who live in the highlands of New Britain have for thousands of years been dancing, uh, dances, fire dances, which evoke forest spirits. This is one of the more dramatic moments in one of these uh, dances where uh, one of the local people will leap through the fire um, and his, his feet are bound in, in wet grass so he doesn't burn his feet. These people too are part of the same gene pool as the people of the Valley and Valley and other highland regions of New Guinea. 
So as modern humans work their way through these islands and work their way into New Guinea, it turns out, it appears that at some point they intermarried or intermixed with two groups of people who turn out not to be the uh, uh, Homo erectus or anything like that. Uh, uh, clearly, these people who were there before them were Denisovans, because it's Denisovan DNA that you find, and you find two batches of Denisovans, so to speak, two groups of Denisovans, um, one of which is a somewhat older group, the one which is somewhat younger one, and the older group's DNA is found uh, here in um, primarily uh, in the island of New Britain. The younger group is found primarily in the highlands of uh, the main island of New Guinea. What happened? Were the Denisovans there already? If so, they haven't left any other traces. No signs of tools, no signs of technology, nothing, no bones. Um, Nonetheless, uh, the DNA is there. Were they there? Were, did these matings happen on the way to these islands so that the Nisaban matings happened earlier on and the people who first got to New Guinea brought the DNA with them? Did they beat the Nisabans when they arrived on these remote islands in New Guinea? We don't know. Nonetheless, you can see there that the whole story turns out to be extremely complicated and very much tied up with the whole geological and biological history of this region. Well, this just shows you some of the DNA that, uh, that uh, has turned up in, in these studies. Again, uh, we hadn't realized when we visited the Khoisan people of Southern Africa, just what an important role they also played in the history of our species. We met up with the Khoisan here on the Kalahari Desert, south of uh, the great uh, Okavango Delta, which is up here. Here in the northern Kalahari, there are many groups of San tribes people who have been there, it turns out, for many thousands of years. At the time I visited, the genetics seemed to suggest that the Khoisan had split off from other groups of humans in Africa, something on the order of 100,000 years ago. That was roughly the number. It's a big error on that number. But, uh, but the, the, the number it was, was, was not very uh, well known. Um, and the reason that they were isolated, of course, was that they had undergone a long retreat. Khoisan were found very widely throughout Southern Africa, but were driven into various remoter regions by the arrival of the Bantu people from the north about a thousand years ago, and later on, of course, by the arrival of Europeans, the arrival of the Dutch and so on, in, who colonized South Africa. They were driven into the Kalahari uh, and other remote regions uh, by the arrival of these other people. But they hung on to their traditions, they hung on to their, their, their identity, um, and have managed to, to retain these throughout this whole process. Botswana is Okavango Delta, of course, is a magnificent place. It's wonderful to fly over the Delta and see all the animals down there doing their thing. This is the Aro tribe, and this is one of the uh, traditional uh, hunting and dancing uh, rituals. Uh, it's an oryx hunt. The, the uh, oryx antelope with its long horns here is represented by this boy who is pretending to be an oryx. They, the men here are, are hunting him. And we went out with the ladies of the group into the brush to find out what we could eat. They were very good at finding all kinds of things. They were fabulous hunter gatherers because of course they had to be. They had to, it's absolutely, they absolutely depended on uh, the ability to find all kinds of food. This is the lady uh, who is the leader of the foraging group, Ning Gai. Uh, I'm not very good at this because she, she, uh, she uh, speaks, they all speak a, a click language. And the click there was sort of beyond my capability, but you get the general idea. It's a language which is spoken uh, 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 by only isolated groups in this region and other click languages are spoken elsewhere in Africa, but they're very, very old languages indeed. And the real ancientness of those languages is something we're only just beginning now to find out. She knows where to find stuff. If you're in the middle of the Kalahari, you may need a drink because it's a great place to die at first. Uh, if you know 
what to look for, you can find a little plant. And underneath this little plant, buried a couple of feet out of the ground, you may find a giant liquid filled tuber. This tuber is uh, uh, very watery. You can get a really quite a refreshing drink of water from one of these tubers. They also spent a lot of time on our little expedition catching these little blue crested uh, jewel beetles, which live up at the tops of the trees. Um, and you can roast the beetles. And uh, I don't recommend them because obviously they, they, uh, they don't taste very good to us. But the locals were just wolfing them down as if they were chocolate covered strawberries. They thought they were great. And indeed, they are uh, very nutritious, chock full of fats, chock full of proteins. So if you want to know how to survive in the Kalahari, the Khoisan are the people to consult. Now, we know, and this has only just come out, uh, a remarkable study that was recently uh, published about uh, some DNA that's been obtained from some relatively old skeletons of Khoisan. In particular, one skeleton was found right over uh, in, the, um, uh, uh, in, in the eastern part of what is now South Africa. And this is a skeleton which is about a thousand years old, more than a thousand years old, and it predates the arrival of the Bantu. So these, this skeleton carries a pure Khoisan genes. There's been no intermixing with the Bantu, and as a consequence, you can get a pretty good notion of when the real split happened between the Khoisan, these two different groups of Khoisan that are looked at here, and the rest of us, in particular Africans, and right down here, the non-Africans who left Africa, this group of people, uh, and the ancestors of the Khoisan split something on the order of uh, 250 to 300,000 years ago. And this, it turns out, it's approximately half of the way back to the split between our ancestors and the peoples who eventually gave rise to the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. Now, I had no idea that the people I was having such a good time with here in South Africa, the people who were showing me so much about how they had survived, so much about their remarkable history, that these people had been separated from the rest of us for something on the order of uh, 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 250 to 300,000 years. Astonishing. And we're just beginning now to grasp some of this. Well, what this really means, I think, is it will be to bump into any Neanderthals or Denisovans, they too would turn out, without a doubt, to have a remarkable set of characteristics, a remarkable set of skills and talents that have since been lost, perhaps, and many of them have, but which nonetheless allowed them to survive in some pretty dramatic and uh, dangerous environments. So this gives you just a quick glimpse of the kinds of things that have happened to our species or the kinds of things that I quite missed in my travels at the time that I went there for the simple reason that some of this fast moving field had not happened yet. Some of the new discoveries had yet to happen. But meanwhile, I was plodding along on looking at a more complex uh, situation. Start, for years now, I've been working with tropical ecologists around the world and we've been looking at um, the uh, ways in which, by the way, how am I doing on time? We're good, Professor Wilson. We're enjoying it very much. Please keep going. Please keep going. Okay, I get it up. Okay. So, what uh, uh, I did essentially was get involved in a long standing project, a project that's been going on for decades now, in which the Smithsonian Institution has been looking at forests around the world and encouraging local uh, 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 ecologists to, to go in and very carefully assess the forests, see what these forests consist of, how many different species of tree there may be, where they, all the trees are, how quickly they uh, grow, how quickly they, uh, they recruit, how quickly they die. All this information essentially is available now and you can get, it turns out, an astonishing amount of information out of it. So let me just give you an idea of what's involved here. We're going to zoom in here. Hold on to your hat. Here is the Smithsonian Institution itself. Many of you have been there, of course. And we're now going to zoom away from the Smithsonian and travel all the way down to the first of these forests that was established back in the 1970s. This is a forest on Barrow, Colorado Island. Now, this island is an island in the middle of Lake Gatun which forms part of the Panama Canal. 
And uh, because the, uh, the uh, lake surrounds the island now, the island is pretty pristine. So there is a little research station on the island, but most of the island is essentially virgin forest. Oops. Okay, here we go. And this is where the Bower of Colorado Island plot is. It's about half a square kilometer in size. Every tree in this forest has been identified and repeatedly censused over time. There's now something on the order of uh, nearly 40 years of data now that are available for this forest. Uh, they've been following the fate of a quarter of a million trees made up of well over 300 different species. So it's an extremely diverse forest. And there are many other forests now, over 50 of them around the planet uh, in tropical, subtropical and temperate regions. And these forests are all being followed in the same kind of detail as the Paracolorado forest. Here are some of the forests we looked at. In fact, these little red dots show you the forests that we examined in a recent paper. There are 16 of them here. You can see they're scattered all the way uh, from the tropics all the way up to to very northern regions here. Here's one in the UK, here's one in the US, that are really quite, north, quite far north. And the remarkable thing is that the patterns we picked up in these forests are rather uh, are shared by all these different forests, no matter where the forests are. This is one of the forests. Uh, Sylvester Tan is in charge of one forest in Borneo, uh, in Sarawak, the northern part of Borneo. You can see him suspended over this forest in, uh, in a little walkway. And uh, you know, there are 800, uh, more than 800 species of tree in the Lambert plot. He knows all of them and a lot of other species too. He's pretty impressive. These big trees that you see here are typical for a rainforest. This is a pristine rainforest in Guyana. This is my colleague uh, Nimal uh, Gunatilika, who is at the Sinharaja plot in Sri Lanka. This is a very heavily forested area. It's also full of uh, uh, leeches. So <laughs> you're going to lose a lot of blood, blood if you go into this forest. This is a blue magpie, which is uh, somewhat endangered now. And it's unique to the Sinharaja area, kind of a mascot of our project. And here is a forest that some of you may have visited. Uh, White and Woods, which is just outside of Oxford in England. It's a forest that has been untouched essentially since medieval times. And it too, as I say, uh, far fewer species in this forest, far fewer species of tree. But the relationships between the species uh, are very similar to those that you find even in the most crowded tropical forests. These are the kinds of interactions that we're fascinated by. Here are a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, ants that are uh, defending, furiously defending this young cecropia tree. Uh, you can see here they're fighting this little beetle as it's strayed onto the tree and the, the ants are busily attacking the beetle. The ants are protecting the tree and as a consequence, uh, the ants benefit and the tree benefits. This kind of interaction is one that fascinates us. I spent a lot of time looking for signs of such interactions. Here, for example, is a, a typical sort of interaction that may lead to the maintenance of many different species simultaneously in the forest. Um, suppose you have young trees of a certain species. These young trees are clustered because with some tree that left their seeds behind, they grow up. As they do so, eventually, the specialized pathogens and parasites that prey upon these young trees begin to accumulate in this part of the forest. And when they do, then they kill any baby trees that might be established here. The only way baby trees of this species can establish is by appearing somewhere else in the forest. So a new cluster may appear over here. It's going to be a while before this new cluster uh, begins to accumulate all these pathogens. In the meantime, these trees grow old and die, and this new cluster now it's where the action is. This means essentially that trees that are rare, a, a species that's rare in the forest has an advantage because there aren't many pathogens around. It loses that advantage when they become common and when they become crowded because then the pathogens begin to build up. This kind of dynamic, which is extremely common in the natural world, helps to explain why there are many different species, but there are lots and lots of other dynamics as well going on. So just recently, in fact, just a few days ago, we published a big paper on this 
on these different, 16 different forests, you can see all the different people involved and from all around the world uh, uh, working on these forests. And it was a lot of fun to do all this stuff. Um, what we find when we look in detail at the data from the forest is that if we look at a tree and look at the trees that surround it, we can ask how this tree interacts with other species or members of the same species that are very closely related to it, and how it reacts with other species that are more distantly related to it. And we can follow two different axes, if it were, on this data. We can look at the, the physical distance between the trees. In other words, how far away they are from each other. By looking at trees that are very nearby, trees that are further away, each of these rings is of the same area. So you have the same number of trees in this ring as you do in this ring. Um, and you can look at that axis thing, which is the, the physical distance between the trees. Or you can look at the axis, which is the evolutionary distance between the trees measured in millions of years. And the evolutionary distance gives you very different results. In the physical distance axis, here's the three-dimensional plot that shows this, the physical distance axis, uh, the interactions get weaker with distance, with increasing distance, the trees interact more, uh, we more weakly with each other. And it's very smooth. But along the phylogenetic distance, along the evolutionary distance axis, you get effects that go up and go down. You might have very weak effects as you do here uh, between trees that are relatively closely related. And you might suddenly get much stronger effects between trees that are more distantly related. Now, our analysis allows us to pick out the most interesting collections of trees that are involved in these differences. And so what we're currently doing is seeing whether we can uh, tunnel down and find out what interactions between other species, what interactions between their parasites and their pathogens, their pollinators, the animals and plants that may exist in symbiosis with them, what all these interactions are doing to help to explain why all these big differences in the the overall species species interactions, uh, what these differences are due to. And we have some clues for some of these interactions that we're going to be learning a lot more in subsequent years. So all this then really grew out of my total fascination with evolution and how it shaped our planet. And as you know, in many parts of the world, that people believe in evolution. Here in Iceland, for example, uh, something on the order of 80 something percent of people think that evolution is true. And down here in Turkey, you find that the number is something on the order of 25 percent. And we don't do much better than Turkey, but lots of other countries that are ahead of us on this. And here are all the people over here who either don't know, uh, or somebody doesn't know in such a survey, or the people who say, no, no, evolution didn't happen. And what I would like to do, if I could, is persuade these people to come with me and uh, show them how evolution informs and illuminates everything that we see around us as we travel around the world, or even as we go for walks in our neighborhood. Okay. Thank you for your attention. I'll turn it back here again. Thank you so much, Professor Wills, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, we'll clap right now, but be assume you can't hear. <laughs> um, now we have um, time for, oh, we, we do have digital clap here. We have time for uh, questions. Professor Wills, if this is okay with you. And sure. We could start with um, Carol from Southwestern College. Uh, she says, a year, a year or two ago, Concepcion was moved eight or nine feet closer to Santiago. And then she's asking, what do you think of Tom Demir Group's find of tools down in Bonita Chula Vista? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't Demir. understand that part of the, uh, can you try that again? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me well? Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the last bit I couldn't follow. Yes. What do you think of Tom Demir Group's find of tools down in Bonita, Chula Vista? Yeah, it's Tom Demeray. Tom Demeray, thank you. I think I, I've lost track. I'm sorry, I, I don't follow up then. Carol, would you like to repeat the question, please? 
Yeah, so Tom Damaray is the paleontologist at the Natural History Museum. And yeah. in the last couple of years, uh, they excavated down around uh, Chula Vista, uh, Highway 54, uh, and found uh, tools uh, that appear to have been uh, used by at least some kind of version of humans. And I just was wondering if you had any comments on, because obviously it's a con controversy because it would put human presence here in California way further back than the 10,000, 12,000 years that we generally speak about. Yes. Um, now the, the data, I'm afraid, are a little on the shaky side. And, and uh, the reason they are is because we don't have a smoking gun here. What you find is um, uh, rocks that have been split in a way that suggests that they could be in the process of being turned into tools. And um, the, uh, and the, uh, uh, the, in order to be reasonably confident that, that, that uh, this was, was done by humans, I think you'd have to have some more, more information than we've currently got on this site. So I, I tend to be very much a skeptic when, when, as far as this site is concerned. I think we need a lot more information before we, before we do something which really does uh, go absolutely against all the other evidence that's been collected so far about when people arrived on the order of perhaps 13, 14,000 years ago in the Americas. And then it adds to the, the what about, uh, is it, it's something like um, Coso Man up further north off of Highway 15, which I think also there's been some controversy about uh, the age of the arrival of humans. Yeah, okay, uh, just a second. Uh, just a second, Kim. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, can you still hear me? Yes. yes, we can hear you, Professor Wilson. Yes, okay, good. Um, so, yeah, there have been a lot of things that, uh, that have been that have been uh, put forth that, that uh, um, you know, you, you sort of wait around to see whether any more evidence is going to be uh, coming forth. And so far, the evidence hasn't happened. And so I'm, I'm, um, uh, I'm very, very doubtful, I think, about, about uh, stuff that, that, that is really based very much on fragmentary evidence. Uh, there are a few cases, you know, where we have some really beautiful data that show rather clearly that, that uh, there's something really interesting happened in the past, in particular in some of the South American sites, of which is if maybe some of them are several, perhaps two, three or four thousand years older than the report them were, uh, which is great. Um, and further, there's also some very strange traces in DNA that have turned up in some uh, groups in, uh, in Brazil that huh, look as if they're very closely allied to Polynesians of all people. How on earth did this DNA end up in that part of the world? We have a lot of questions here that I think we have to really wrestle with. But I want to see good hard data here before I start running around overturning paradigm. Yeah, the DNA, I think, even down in Chile shows Asian DNA. Yeah, yeah. So it, it looks, and then of course, just recently, uh, some. Um, some traces of uh, South American DNA have been found uh, in um, uh, around um, some of the islands of the South Pacific. So it looks as if Thor Heyerdahl might have been correct, and that some people managed to get across from uh, from uh, South America to to islands that are fairly close to it in, in the Pacific. So I, I I love DNA because it's, it it gives you thousands or millions of data points, right? And you can really get an astonishing amount of information out of that DNA. Um, some of the stuff that I showed you about these mysterious Denisovan traces of DNA, we don't know if I say exactly where that DNA came from, but we do know that the pieces of DNA, Denisovan DNA, in the people who live in New Guinea, 
are big enough, each stretch of DNA is large enough that these uh, the, these genetic exchanges between their ancestors and the Denethans happened relatively recently. I mean, recently in the sense of perhaps you know, thousands of years ago, but nonetheless, um, had it happened further ago than that, the bits of DNA in modern people would be much smaller because these bits of DNA get mixed up by genetic exchanges between uh, their DNA and the DNA of the Denethans, and those pieces of DNA will get nibbled down smaller and smaller. And that hasn't happened as much, indicating that these exchanges happen uh, remarkably recently. And this kind of clue is something that a geneticist can really latch onto because you can get a pretty good notion of what went on. Now, do we have any physical evidence of when this happened and how? No, we don't. So the questions, of course, are, are huge. But the DNA gives us a clue to look for, uh, start looking for stuff. And um, we may or may not find uh, more evidence that would, would support such a, a, a scenario. But the DNA is saying, look, look, if this is really, really neat. Broken bits of stone that are found in sort of odd places, and therefore they shouldn't be, with no context, no, no, no human signs of other human occupation. Uh, this worries me. Okay, I need something a little bit firmer than that. Thank you, Professor Mills. Do we have more questions for Professor Wills, please, if you would like to raise your hand digitally or even um, I, I can, Gerald, please, would you unmute yourself? Gerald Quimet? Am I unmuted now? You're, yes, please, go ahead. Yes, the question I had was, it caught me right at one of the earlier slides of that of the spread of uh, humans across the planet. And you, you showed it goes back many thousands of years, the spread that goes down towards the, through Asia and the South Pacific. And yet there's a gap where it spreads up through Siberia and over to North America. And it just, it just catches your attention. Why was there such a gap before they went north? But they did go all the way north into Siberia because we've got more evidence now that people were up there certainly um, by uh, 50, 60,000 years ago. People around uh, Lake Baikal, people in that region um, have bits of DNA indicating that, that, that there were lots of people living up there. But there was an enormous block here. And the block had to do with the fact that, that when uh, North America and Asia were joined together, um, across what is now the Bering Strait, um, that whole region was essentially blocked by glaciers. And it must have been really, really difficult to get across. So the genetic evidence is fascinating. It suggests that what happened was a series of stages. People actually made it into the region uh, up in northern Alaska, at least briefly, because there are indications from some uh, old bones that have been found there um, that there were people living there as early as 40,000 years ago. Mm. And 40? then later on, mm. when the glaciers began to melt, then people could make that final step across those glaciers and they start to work their way down the west coast of North America. And of course, from there, they spread like wildfire. Um, so that barrier, of course, um, was, um, must have been essentially insurmountable for long periods of time. And that, that explains the gap. Um, once people got across that gap, of course, it was, it was fairly plain sailing, but the gap must have been huge because those glaciers were really extensive. They covered the right, whole Alaska region, they covered well down into British Columbia. They, they, I imagine, you know, it, 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 it would be very, very difficult to travel over thousands of miles of ice. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Do we have? Other questions for Professor Wills? You could um, add them to the chat room or you could raise your hand, please. I do have a question, Professor Wills. Um, it's just shocking to see the ladies cutting their fingers off. Why that <laughs> vice versa? Why not the man would cut their fingers instead? 
Well, um, I'm afraid that the ladies were easy to catch and um, and to to, uh, uh, to chop the fingers off of. Um, I'm afraid what we're looking at here is a very sexist tradition indeed. <laughs> and one yes, that, yes, luckily, and then is, is being abandoned. Yeah, you see it, the ladies in Africa with their, of course, they are all smiling, but hunter hunter gatherers and and uh, like more dominant. So. My next question, like, when would it, when did it start? Is it more dominant the males in in the islands than in Africa? Well, it varies tremendously. Uh, one, uh, some groups, directly, uh, uh, in, 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 in very, very few cases, you really do have a matriarchal society in which the women really are the bosses, and that's rather rare. I'm afraid in most cases, the men sort of tend to take leadership roles, whether they deserve it or not. And uh, <laughs> working our way out of this and fighting our way uh, free of this particular situation is, is something that we've spent quite a, quite a few thousand years doing. We're not there yet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, thank you, Professor Wills. Uh, oh, uh, testosterone rules. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> That was a comment on the chat. Well, any more questions, please? Do I see any more raised hands? No? Okay. I think uh, we will finish now. Professor Wills, thank you very much for wonderful. being here. It was a wonderful presentation. We really enjoyed it. And we will yeah. see you back next month. Thank you very much to all. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Professor Wills. Thank you. Impressive. Always fascinating. Thank you.